I'm, I'm going to speak a message that uh, will be for those who can receive it. It's a strong message. The name of the message is, it's called A Shocking Truth. Say A Shocking Truth. A lot of times God can't reveal himself to us for who he really is because we just won't accept it. Um, God is who he says he is. He's not who we think he is. How do we know who God, who God is? Because we look from Genesis to Revelation. For instance, God told Adam and his wife, he said, there's uh, all these trees in the garden. You can eat from all of them, including the tree of life. But there's a tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat it. You eat it, you're dead. The, the Hebrew says, dying you shall die. He told them. And he wasn't fooling around. And they ate from that tree, and they died. They died to holiness and obedience to the divine nature. Right away, Adam's blaming the woman. Of course, the woman turned around and said, the snake gave it to me, the, you know, and it's true. Uh, but there's some truths that we need to face, and you can't really, the, the, uh, I'm going to say the American church, American believer, uh, to a great extent, we're spoiled rotten. We like to have it our way. And really what a lot of us do, and part of it is wrong teaching, but, but it's also laziness, we want God to do our part. We want God to do our part. Now, I'm going to make a statement here. God is not moved by your circumstances. God's not moved by your circumstances. I can prove it. Um, go to leper col uh, colonies, and, and they still got them around the world. You can go to leper colonies, and you see multitudes of people, including children, that are full of leprosy. And they're dying. Leprosy. God, why doesn't you do something? Because God's not moved by that. God's not moved by our problems. Not unless you say, oh, then if God's not moved by my problems, what am I going to do? No, no. You got to understand what moves God. What moves God is faith. That's what moves God. You, you, you need to understand it. What moves God is faith. You know, if you go out here and you have, uh, buy a brand new automobile and you pull up to a farmer's, a farmer's uh, yard and you grab a water hose and fill your gas tank with water, how many know your car ain't going nowhere? That car is designed to operate by gas. It says, the just shall live by faith. Huh. Doesn't say by your feelings, by your emotions, by your circumstances. By faith. Trust in God. And, and, and faith in God means <clears throat> we do what God's word says. See, that, that's, a, a lot of people understand that. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted a morning, weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Your joy in the heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. So God... God requires you to seek him. That's, it, it don't matter. See, it, it, God's not a respecter of people. God isn't going to treat Mike Yeager any different than anybody else. So if God's not a respecter of people, what that means is God doesn't look at Mike Yeager, his education, his skin. Oh, he's a male, she's a female. She, uh, you know, he's black, he, he's Asian, he's Caucasian. No, God don't look at that. God looks for faith. And where a lot of people are making a big mistake in, in, in our society is they're expecting God to do something that he never said he would do. God, God, you expect God just to look at your problem and just to solve it for you. Well, first of all, God's already done everything he's ever going to do. He overcame principalities and powers. He said, behold, all authority has been given unto me. See, he's expecting us to do something. And... Actually, we say, well, you know, God said, uh, I am the Lord and I change not. 
And then he said this, therefore your sons of Jacob are not destroyed. Uh, what he means is, yes, God is long-suffering, God is merciful, God is kind, God is good, God is all these wonderful things, but there's things that God expects from us. And you know what God expects from us? He expects us to have a faith that produces action. But be doers of the word, like the whole book of James. It, it, it talks about faith without works is dead. Abraham was justified by works. I don't know if you know that. The Bible says Abraham was justified by works. So we're not justified by works. No, it's a works that was a result of faith. Because he had faith, he offered up Isaac. Therefore, he was called the friend of God. God expects you to believe. For instance, why don't a lot of people pray? Because they don't really believe that God's going to hear their prayers. Uh, we're in a time of a crisis of lack of faith in the church in America. There really is, and it's not just America, it's around the world. But there's a real lack of faith. Now, I, I want to, and, and don't misunderstand me, this is not, you know, Paul said I would have gave you meat, but I can't, because, you know, they were in strife and anger and bitterness, and that's the works of the flesh. And he says, I, I, you know, when people get in bitterness, you can't say things to them. How many found that out? When people have bitterness in their heart, hate in their heart, strife in their heart, you might as well just zip the lip because they're not going to have, especially if you're the one they're angry with. <laughs> if they're mad at you, if they're bitter at you, I mean, there's, there, I, I don't understand it, but there's a lot of people who are bitter at Mike Yeager. And as far as I know in my heart, I've not done anything against them, but somehow the devil got them to be bitter and angry with me. And so what do I do? I pray for them. I don't attack them. I don't demean them. I just pray for them because I know I can't help them. Matter of fact, the Bible even says that basically you are without honor in your own home. Among your own country people, they could not accept what Jesus had to say. It's what we call the sin of familiarity. People think they know you. See, they thought they knew Jesus. They didn't know Jesus. But I just, and you can go, you can write down these scriptures tonight, but I want to move rather quickly. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12, it, it talks about King Asa. And in the 30th and 9th year of his reign, he got diseased in his feet. And until his disease was exceedingly great. Now listen, so, he got a disease. Now, healing was in the Old Covenant. Did you know that? Yeah. Healing was available for the seed of Abraham in the Old Covenant. So he got diseased in his feet, yet in his disease, notice this, he sought not the Lord. He didn't seek God. Guess what he did? Now, this is Old Covenant. How I many you know the New Covenant is far better? So listen, this is a king in the Old Covenant, a seed of Abraham. He got a disease in his feet, and he did not cry out to God. He did not go to the Lord. He did look to the covenant, but instead he went to the physicians. But instead of going to God, he went to the medical world. And that is basically the modern-day church in America. They go to the medical world. Now, pastor, are you telling me to stay away from the medical world? No, I'm saying seek God. But see, we get lazy. I've been there. I remember one time I had a, a, a friend of mine was coming. Now, he went home to be with the Lord, Albert Willis, and he was really, really strong in faith. But Albert Willis was coming, and he was going to preach for me, and I got a little bit of congestion in my lungs, just a little bit, instead of coming against it and taking a hold of healing and crying out to God and commanding it to go. The thought came to me as a little boy, I was a very sick little boy, that my mom would rub me down with Vicks vapor rub, and she'd give me the Vicks or give me the, the, the cough syrup, and then she'd also put on a vaporizer with a Vicks in it. And this thought stronghold was in my mind so I decided to do, go that route instead of looking to God now I knew better but I went and got the Vicks vapor rub and I got myself the cough medicine and I, I didn't have one of those machines but I rubbed my chest on and I took a great big old mouthful of that cough medicine and I laid in bed like I was in heaven and man did I get sick it took me almost three months to get free. 
I mean, this stuff set in. And I said, Lord, what happened? And he said to me, he said, it's your fault. I said, what? He said, you didn't look to me. You were looking to the world, and this is what you got. I know this is, see, Jesus says, you will know the truth. How many know the truth is, it, it, it's not always what we want to hear? It's not what we want to hear. We, we want to hear it's not your fault. It's God's fault. A lot of people are bitter at God because they're expecting God to do their part. No, God says you do your part. And so what happened to King Asa? He slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. He died. It didn't say he went to hell, okay? I'm not saying if you die sick, you're going to hell. But he didn't look to God. And actually, the previous verse says that the prophet of the Lord came to him, and because instead of looking to God, he, was, he, he, he hired another, another king to come and help him, some heathens. And the prophet showed up and he said, what in the world did you go to them for? You cried out to God in the past. The, in the past, you cried out to God and God helped you. Why did you go to this man? He said, now because of this, he said, war will never cease with the Philistines. I believe it was the Philistines. And it says the king got bitter, at, the king Asa got bitter and he locked up that prophet. Listen, they never, they never killed prophets because they told them what they wanted to hear. They only kill men of God when they tell you what you don't want to hear. And the man of God said to the king, why did you go to them? You know, you know how to trust God. You know, see, that's another thing. Sometimes if you've never known how to trust God, you've never known how to believe God. See, I know in my heart those things you can maybe get away with. I can't. You know why? Because I know how to trust God in certain areas. I know how to believe God. How many know that sometimes we choose just not to trust him? We choose not to look to him. And, and there's scriptures that says this. Listen, Jeremiah 17, 5. Say, I cannot be offended. Now, I'm going to explain this scripture to you. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man, the believer, that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in the arm of the flesh. They know how to trust God. They know how to look to God. They know how to believe. But instead of looking to God, they go to men. They put their confidence in men. And they depart from the Lord. Now you say, oh, well, Pastor Mike, no true believer would do that. Really? Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. You... you, you, you you, you kick God out of the equation. But he is the equation. He is the answer. He is the remedy. The Bible says he is the balm of Gilead. Uh, in, in 1 Chronicles 10 chapter and verse 6, King Saul dies. Let me read this to you. So Saul died and his three sons and all of his house died together. Remember this morning I took you to Exodus and chapter 34. It says that he's long suffering. He's merciful. He's kind. He's good. He'll forgive your transgressions. He says, but he does not forgive the transgressions of the guilty, but it is passed on to the children, the children, children, and children's children. And I explained that to you. What he was saying is this, that if you are guilty and you want to acknowledge your guilt, you won't say, Lord, I'm wrong. Lord, I should have never done that. I should have never said that. I should have never. Lord, please forgive me. If you, if you refuse to acknowledge your guilt, you are in big trouble. And it's not that God is going to do something bad to you. You've opened the door to the devil wide open. And this is what's happening with a lot of people. People, they open the door to the devil. And the Bible says, give no place to the devil. There's been times when I got out of the will of God and the Lord told me, and I knew I was on thin, thin ice. He said, if you don't repent now, the devil's going to wipe you out, Mike. People say, well, why did brother and soul so die? It must have been God's will for them to die in that airplane accident. No, it was never the will of God for a minister of the gospel to die in an airplane accident. Somehow the door got opened. 
For instance, I, 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 I'm going to write a book on it, uh, you know, don't blame God, but in it I'll, do, I'll deal with Job. I found, I went through the, what Job said. Now, Job was a righteous man, and that means this. He walked in the knowledge that he had to the extent he knew. He, there are things he didn't know. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. That's why you need knowledge. See, I'm telling you, the only reason I know I'm still on this earth is because when I got born again, I began to devour the life of Jesus, and I got some knowledge. I got some insight. I got some information. And, when I went, and, and now, all of a sudden, I discovered I didn't have to be a victim. I could be victorious. I, I didn't have to put up with sickness. I didn't have to put up with disease. I didn't have to put up with fear. I didn't have to put up with anxiety. I didn't have to put up with bitterness. I didn't have, in my heart, in my heart, I didn't have to put up with it. And I could take authority over it. But see, a lot of believers either don't know they have authority or they don't want to exercise authority. I've seen mom and dads do it. I see them going to the store and they got little Johnny who's only two years old. And they, they're, they're pulling their hair out of their head. I don't know what to do with Johnny. I can't control him. You can't control a two-year-old kid? You can't discipline a two-year-old kid? No, it's you're, you're lazy. Spiritually ignorant and lazy. Say, I cannot be offended. Now, really, this ain't for you all here tonight, because I know that you're all beyond this, and it's only for those who are watching by Internet, okay? So I understand that. But anyways, I, so, you know, you, you, see, you say, well, wait a minute. You're five foot eight, 200 pounds, little Johnny, maybe two feet tall, and weighs 30 pounds. And you can't handle him? You can handle him. You just don't want to. You need to do it the biblical way, in love. Not yell, not slap, not scream. I see him do it in the stores all the time. Yelling and screaming. How many times did I tell you? No, 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 no. Man, you don't have to yell at him like an idiot. Really, Johnny's not the problem. You're the problem. Listen. A lot of times we can't heal, get healed. It's not God. It's not God's fault you can't get healed. You think, well, why won't God heal me of my cancer? Well, why is it your cancer? I thought Jesus took your cancer. I thought Jesus took your arthritis. I thought Jesus took your problems. I thought casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you. Well, if he cares for me, why doesn't he do something? He says, why don't you do something? I, old covenant. Moses... He's leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? They come to the Red Sea. And here comes the Egyptians, like God put up a wall of fire between them, right? And, and, and the Egyptians can't get to them. And Moses begin to cry, oh, God, do something. You know what God said to Moses? Moses, stop your belly aching and crying. Now, listen, he's got the Red Sea in front of him, right? God says, you do something. What? He says, you do something. Well, God, well, what do you mean? He says, what do you have in your hand? He said, a rod. Now, remember, that's the rod that he used to strike the, 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 the waters, and he turned to blood, he struck the sand, and he turned to lice. For other words, you got a miracle-working rod in your hand. Do you know what that rod was? Symbolic of the Word of God. He says, you've got the Word of God. Say, I've got the Word of God. Oh, I'm telling you, man, I'm preaching better than you're responding. You've got the Word of God. You've got the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down the strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and bringing the captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. You're telling me your imagination, your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions are stronger than God? No, they're not. We got powerful weapons. Say, I've got powerful weapons. And so he said, you got a rod in your hand. He said, you do something, Moses. And so he took the rod and he put it over the problem. And the power of God came and the wind blew all night and it split that Red Sea and they walked across the dry side land. Yeah, you have the word of God. You've got the Holy Ghost. You've got the name of Jesus. You've got the blood of Jesus. You've got the nature of Jesus. He said, you have overcome them, little ones, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yeah. Come on, man, that's the church. A shocking truth. People don't want to know. You, you, yeah. 
you, you can do something about your situation. And you don't have to run to men. Say, thank God I don't have to run to a man. Come on, lady, say that. <laughs> now, the only man you need to go to, his name is Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? Okay, so Saul died and his three sons. They arose, all the valiant men, and they took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the oak of Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died, listen, for his transgressions which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, listen, which he kept not. For other words, God gave him a word, he wouldn't obey the word. He wouldn't do the word. He wouldn't submit to the authority of God. But listen, listen to this now. This is very interesting. And this is 1 Chronicles chapter 10 and verse 13. And also, this is why he died. King Saul didn't have to die. Actually, he fell on his sword and he committed suicide. And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it and inquired not of the Lord. He didn't go to God. Yeah, but Pastor Mike, he knew that God was upset with him. You can still go to God. God was upset with him because he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't listen to anything God had to say. You know, in the beginning, he was little in his own eyes and and, and, and God told him through the prophet Samuel, hey, when you go and, and, and king, kill King Agag and, and the Anakites, and he said, don't leave anything alive. Uh, Elijah, uh, Samuel comes, the bleeding of the sheep. He says, what's this I'm hearing? He said, well, I just kept the best for a sacrifice to the Lord. And then he saw the king sitting there. Why didn't you kill him? He said, because he was a wicked, wicked, wicked man who the devil used to wipe out God's people. Now don't tell me there's not judgment against wicked men. What do you think the days of Noah was? It wasn't the devil that sent the flood. See, this is what I'm saying. A lot of people, they're trying to put God in a little box. See, Job thought he knew God. There's 21 things that Job said about God that was not true. Now, he was sincere, so when God finally showed him up, he, Job, his eyes were opened, and he said, I abhor myself in sackcloth and ashes. I thought I knew you, God, but now I should have put a hand over my mouth. I didn't really know you, God. Well, how do we know what God is like? Read your Bible. Find out what God is like. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap. He that sows to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. He that sows to the spirit shall the spirit reap life everlasting. My sister came to me many, many years ago, Debbie. I, I, I led her to the Lord. She was two years older than me. I just loved her. She used to be my secretary. And she, um, she had a problem with smoking cigarettes. I didn't attack her. I had religious people in the church attacking her. Uh, and I'm not justifying smoking, but you know what? Uh, I'm not quite sure if smoke, I don't know if smoking will keep you out of heaven. I really don't. But I know bitterness will. Gossip will. Backstabbing will. Hate will. Hello? So uh, she came to me and she said to me, uh, Mike, will you pray that I won't get cancer from smoking? She was sincere. Tears in her eyes. I'm young preacher back in about 1987. And I told her with great sadness in my heart, I said, Debbie, I can't. What? I said, I cannot pray that you won't get cancer from smoking. I said, I can pray and ask God to deliver you from smoking, and then, in Jesus' name, you won't get cancer. Because God will he'll wipe that all out, what you've done. Because I used to do three and a half packs of cigarettes a day. My whole family were, were, were tobacco addicts, man. We all. I started smoking probably when I was 12 years old. We'd sit around the kitchen table all smoking Winston's. Then they got mad at me because I switched to Marlboro. I mean, that's all. From the, and it was the glory, but it wasn't the Shekinah glory around our kitchen table. My mom smoked. My dad smoked. My, my, my brother smoked. I smoked. My sister smoked. Uh, my younger brothers ended up smoking. But anyways, so I said, I'm sorry, Debbie. I hate to tell you this. She died from cancer. She, see, see we, we, we want God to work with us on our terms. 
And God said, no, I don't work with you on your... You're not going to make a deal with God. God, I want to make a deal with you. He said, no, no, here's the deal. Here's my way. Walk ye in it. That's God. Hell is full of people today. You know why? Because they didn't want to see it God's way. I, I know, I know, you're not supposed to say that. Uh, I put a video up on my YouTube channel the other day about hell. And uh, this preacher's preaching about hell very passionately. Who's in hell? And, 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 and our hearts ought to be broken over this. And I, I sent it to my three brothers. My, my oldest brother, Dennis, he came back at me. How come, how come you're pushing this video about hell? I said, Dennis, I said, it's a part of the gospel. Jesus talked about hell more than any other preacher in the Bible. If Jesus preached about the reality of hell, then we should too. But with love, with compassion. It says in, 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 in snatching them out of the flames of hell. If for adventure they'll listen in the book of Jude. It's a part of the gospel. So are we supposed to just pick what we want and leave out the rest because people don't want to hear it? That's what I'm doing tonight. I'm telling you, man, there's things people in America, Christians, don't want to hear. And, 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 and I know this is what happened here. I had in, in total attendance at one time, I had about 600 people. Now, a, a, a good amount of those people didn't leave because they didn't like what they were hearing, but they got sucked up in the whirlwind of bitterness and gossip, and you know that's how the devil does this. Uh, years ago, Mark Barkley, who's a good preacher, he, uh, he's a pastor of a church in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, I think he's in. Is he in Michigan? No, Minnesota. And he said he was sitting in his congregation, and all of a sudden he had an open vision, and he saw like the claw of a, a demonic power come in, a gigantic claw with long fingernails, and it stuck one person through the chest, stuck another person through the chest, stuck an, and before it got done, it had a living human being on each of its, its long fingernails. And then it picked the people up, pulled them out of the congregation, next thing you know, a lot of people ran from the building. He said, Lord, what's that? He said, uh, that's exactly how the devil works in, in, in the house of God. He says, how that? He said, number one, did you notice that when the enemy pierced them with the long fingernails, those people didn't struggle to get off the fingernails? He said, yeah. He said, basically, they weren't sent to the church by God. They were sent there by the devil. He said, and what happens when those people get sucked out of the congregation, all of a sudden you got a group of people leave, people begin to say, oh, something must be wrong here. Something must not be right. Where'd so-and-so go? Where'd brother so-and-so go? Where'd sister so-and-so go? And, and, most, and most people don't have enough spiritual tenacity to stay in God's will no matter what. Happened to Jesus. He said, eat my flesh, drink my blood. Some guys got offended. He lost almost all of his disciples. You know what? He didn't chase them. He didn't chase them. Why? And he said to his disciples, you guys want to go? See, because what we're talking about here is talking about an aggressive love. Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? And this is after Peter denied him three times. Peter, and he asked him three, Peter, do you, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord. He said, okay. He said, I want you to feed my sheep. He said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Three. Now, why would he say that to Peter? Now, listen, you've got to follow this to the conclusion of Peter's life. He knew what was going to get Peter killed. He even said the day's going to come when they handcuff you and drag you around. You know what got him killed? Not his good looks, not his intelligence, not his nationality. You know what got him killed? What he was teaching. <laughs> That's why he said, Peter, do you love me? Then you're going to have to teach him the truth. Peter, do you love me or do you want to, do you want, Paul said, if I yet please men, I am not a servant of God. He said, if I teach what men want me to teach, I am not a servant of God. Okay, so he said, Peter, 
what I what you're going to teach is going to get you killed. And they cut off it. Matter of fact, not Paul, they cut his head off, but Peter got hung upside down, crucified upside down. What got him killed? Because he was saying what people didn't like. And that's what happened. I began to really began to preach truth. And people, I mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know it. I had a bunch of people here that were universalists. How many of you know what a universalist? They believe everybody's going to heaven, including the devil. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and then you begin to preach. You've got to live holy. You've got to follow Jesus. You've got to deny your flesh. You've you, you got to take up your cross. You've got to forgive. Uh, you, you, I mean, you got to. I mean, that's what God said. you got to. And they, oh, legalism, legalism. I said, well, wait a minute. Where am I teaching legalism? Well, the Bible says in Galatians that we're, I had a guy call me up one day. He, he was a minister. I knew who was a worship and minister. And he saw one of my sermons on the, on the Internet. And I was preaching out of the, you know, about, about being obedient to God. He called me up and said, you're being, you're being legalistic. I said, okay, tell me how. And he quoted a part of the book of Galatians. And, and I said, oh, I love the book of Galatians. He says, what? I said, I memorized it years ago. I can quote it from, I love it. He said, well, see, they were teaching legalism there, in there. I said, yeah, they were teaching the laws of Leviticus. That's the law we're free from. We're not free from the law of love. You're not free from the law that says thou shalt not commit adultery. You're not free from the law that says thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not have any other gods before you. You're not free from that law. But we look to Christ and he puts the law on our heart and I don't want to commit adultery. I don't want to have no other gods before me. I don't want to lie about you. I don't want to covet your goods. I'm not going to look at Nancy's car. And can I have a way to get her to give that to me? Which God's not telling you to. See what I'm saying? I, I don't want that. He said, I'm going to write the law in your heart. You know, many times I've had people try to give me stuff, and I said, no, I don't want it. Somebody, one time a widow lady came to me, and she wanted to give me, uh, her, bro her brother uh, had to go to prison for something, and a great big old yacht down in Baltimore Harbor. He had a yacht. She came to me and said, Pastor Mike, I want to give you this yacht. And, and I, I got quiet. I said, Lord, tell me what to do. He said, uh, tell her no. I said, okay, no. You don't want the, the yacht? You could sell it and have money for it. I said, no. Lord told me no. Well, they just make good businesses. Somebody, somebody tried to give me a 110-foot uh, tugboat one time on the Mississippi River. And the Lord said, no. I had a wealthy man. His name was uh, Roy Coldsmith. He, he was a big roofer in the community. He got cancer. One of my elders, Bill Looking Bill, led him to the Lord. I got real close to him. God did heal him of the cancer, but he died from a heart attack. But he was taking the radiation and the chemo and all of this stuff, and that's what killed him. But I, one day he called me up, and I'd go to his house and pray with him. And he said, Pastor Mike, will you come over and see me? I said, yes. And I went over, and he, he said, Pastor, I've always done my family wrong. This is what he did. I'm not slandering him. He said, I, I've got all this wealth, and, and, I, I, and I know I want to help the church, but I, I, I just believe I'm supposed to give my wealth to my kids, and, and I want to help them. And I looked at Roy because I needed money. And I said, Roy, if God is telling you to give your wealth to your kids then you give it to them. See, it's not about us. It's about him. And so, because he got counsel from who? Not from God. He inquired not of the Lord. Therefore, he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. For in other words, God knew what was going to happen. But David got the kingdom at that time because... He so wouldn't go to God. Tell your neighbor with all seriousness, go to God. Go to God. Um, now I'm going to, okay, so I, I'm going to just deal with some, before we close here, some little pet peeves. I know in our society today, and I, 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 I've, done, I've done home visitations for sick people. I have. I, I go to hospitals. Uh, I also know people go, don't get upset. They get upset with me when I don't. But let me ask you something. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, how many times did Jesus go specifically to somebody's house in order to get them healed? How many times? Just take a guess. How many times do you think Jesus went to somebody one time? Jairus. Jairus came to Jesus and begged him and beseeched him and said, my daughter is so sick, Jesus, I, and I'm modern vernacular, I can't bring her. She's on the edge of death. Will you please come to my house? He said, yeah, I'll come. So he goes to the house. She died. He raises her from the dead. Now, the centurion, he's also got a very sick servant. He says, uh, ask Jesus if he come and heal my servant. He, he must have been on the edge of death. And Jesus said, only two times in the Bible, and he goes, right? He goes. As he's going, the centurion sends the servant and says, no, tell him not to come. I'm not worthy for him to be in my house. Just speak the word only, my servant will be healed. So what happens? He speaks the word, he gets healed. Then another day, Jesus comes along, and at the pool of Bethesda, how I many know where that was at? I seen it when I was in Israel. There was a multitude of sick, lame, hot, blind, diseased people. A massive group. They were like worms in a can. And he goes to the pool of Bethesda, listen to this, and he steps over Jesus, God in the flesh, steps over all the sick, all the blind, all the diseased people. He steps over them all. That's God in the flesh. Now, listen, you got to listen very carefully why he did this. He steps over them all, right? And he doesn't help none of them. Not one of them. He didn't help one of them. You know why he didn't help them? Because they weren't looking to him. They were looking to the angel that was going to stir the pool. Because once in a while an angel would come and stir the water. And whoever could get into the water first could get healed. But here's the problem. Jesus had already been around for, a long, for quite a while. Could have been a couple of years. Multitudes and multitudes are getting healed and delivered. But guess where they're looking to get healed? They're looking to the pool of water. I'm going to tell you something shocking. There's many in the church world that are not getting healed because they're not looking to Jesus. They're looking to the medicine. They're looking to the... Financially, the Lord showed me this. I, I, I used to borrow money. I did. I got myself in big trouble to keep this place going. Big trouble. Taking all the equity out. How many knew everything fell in 2007? Everything fell in. I, I lost a couple houses, actually. Everything fell in. And, then, and God had been trying to deal with me for years because I didn't know how to... I, I know how to believe God for money, but it's easy to go in and sign some dotted papers and use the equity in your house, right? And when, I, and, and when that thing fell apart... I got into big, big, big trouble. I was so deep in debt, I couldn't see the light of day. And the Lord said to me this, Son, are you finally going to listen to me? I said, Okay, Lord. And I said, Lord, I'll trust you. Well, some of you know about the motorcycle. I had an old motorcycle. I wanted to sell it and get a newer motorcycle, more comfortable, not a brand new one. And... Uh, so I got to willing and dealing in my mind again. How many know we can go back to our old sins? I'm not going to borrow a lot of money, just a little bit of money, just enough. And so Michael, he's going to help me. My son, he's got credit. He's got good credit, you know. And, and so I, I took him up to the motorcycle shop where I wanted the motorcycle, and he gave him the, his credit card, and it turned out they wouldn't accept that credit card. So I went to a friend of mine who had a shop right across from there, and I said, hey, can you get cash off our credit card for this? He said, no, only if you buy equipment. So now I'm at a dead-end road. I'm sleeping that night and I heard the Lord say to me this is like a Saturday night he said to me he said um godliness with contentment is great gain I heard and I woke up and I knew what he meant he said be content with what you have and if I want you to have a better bike I'll give it to you so I came before the church and I confessed it I said oh man I've been coveting after a bike trying to wheel and deal to get the money and I know better and so I repent and I won't do it. I'm telling you, it was within two months that God gave me 
a way nicer bike, debt free, that I've enjoyed riding ever since. It wasn't that I couldn't have the bike. He wanted me to trust him. Put it upon the altar. See? And so the Lord finally had to bring me to a place where I'm not doing it no more, Lord. I'm trusting you for the money. I'm looking to you. I'm believing you. Isn't God wonderful? I'm not saying it's a sin for you to borrow money because otherwise why would God tell you to loan money? But you got to hear from heaven. It could be that God will have you borrow money and believe to God to make the payments. I'm not denying that. I'm just simply saying is we need to inquire of the Lord. We need, so he gets over all the, he walks through the mess of these people. He gets to a man on a cot. He says to the man on the cot, what you need? He said, Lord, I, I want healed, but I can't get into the pool because every time somebody, the, the, the angel stores the water, they jump ahead of me. He said this. He said, it's okay. See, the man, Jesus knew the guy had faith. He said, look to me. He looks at me and said, get up off the ground, pick up your cot, and go home. He didn't argue. This man who's a cripple, and he said, I, I, I need somebody to help me get an order. Jesus says, get up. So what did he do? He had to move a finger. I told people, do something you couldn't do. This morning we had a precious sister. We prayed for her. She said her jaw was really hurting and full of pain. Stacy, and laid hands on her. Not just me. I'm having other people lay hands on because you all need to get, you need to begin to get people healed. God said, these signs will follow them that believe. Say, I'm a believer. Wave your hand at me. I'm a believer. I'm a candidate. And so we got done praying. And she says, oh, oh, the pain's all gone. Who healed her? Jesus healed her. And so he takes up his cot. Now, why didn't Jesus heal those multitudes? You know why? Because they didn't come to him. Now, Jesus went to other communities and like he was going at the time he walked on the water, remember that? And then right afterwards they got to the, the country of the G Gerianians or something weird named G-E-R-E and I can't say it. And he says all the villains, they said, oh Jesus is here. And they said they brought all the lame and all the hot and they brought them on cots and they brought them from everywhere. They took them out of the hospitals. They took them out of the infirmities and they brought them to Jesus and everyone he touched was healed. Through the years I've seen people who specifically came here to get healed and they came and got healed. But a lot of people, they won't come. I mean, you can't believe what they'll go through for the doctors. I can't believe what people let themselves go through for the doctors. Wow, well, remember the woman with the issue of blood? She spent all that she had on the physicians, and they gladly took her money. Took it all. They took all of her money. And, and they, they knew they couldn't help her. See, listen, if I was an, in the natural, a mechanic, and you were coming to me, and you wanted me to fix your car, and I knew I couldn't fix your car, if I had any integrity, I'd say, I'm sorry, I can't fix your car. It's, you need a miracle. The medical world should be doing the same. They should be telling people, listen, you better cry out to God because we can't help you. They, they, we, can't, we don't have the medical knowledge to... You need a new liver. You need a new heart. You need a new brain. <laughs> we can't help you. <laughs> but they don't do it. And they didn't tell that little lady. And they took all of her money until she was po absolutely poverty stricken. And now she, she's worse than ever. And listen now, if anybody had an excuse and she could have called in one of her friends and said, Oh, I am so weak because life is in the blood. Oh, I am so weak. Please tell somebody to bring Jesus to me. She did. She heard about Jesus. She pushed up her, she pushed her little feeble, weak body up. Probably had, had probably had to have a, uh, these, these days we got walkers, but probably had a, a cane and, and rags. And she pushes her way. She hears that Jesus is passing by. She 
comes up over the little dusty road, a hill, and there she sees Jesus, but he's on the other side of this massive ocean of people. And she could have sat down in the dust and the dirt and said, Oh, nobody loves me. God, why don't you help me, God? You know what she said? She did. She said, If I can make it through this crowd, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And she began to take her weak, little, sickly body. People can't even make it to church Sunday nights. Preachers don't want to be at church Sunday night. They can't make it to the house of God. Pray for me, Pastor Mike. I'm sick. Well, come. I'll pray for you. Oh, no, 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 Pastor. If you really love me, you'd come and touch my fevered brow. No, come and I'll pray for you. Make it here and I'll pray for you. Uh, listen, I get miracles, and any minister who has any faith in other countries, they'll tell you we get miracles all the time. You know why? They, when I go to the Philippines, I've seen the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. Miracles. You know why? Because those people, they will go through the jungle, over the rivers. They will travel for three days on a donkey to get to the meeting to get somebody with some faith to lay hands on them. And people can't even get into their air-conditioned cars, come down a road for a couple hours, an hour, and get prayed for. But they'll do it, they'll wait in the doctor's office. To me, it seems like days on end. They'll get in there and the doctors will probe them and, sh and, and poke them and cut them and, and radiate them and put them through all kinds of, and run dye through their blood and they got to lay and they can't move and they can't breathe and they put them through hell and back and they walk out of that hospital or that doctor's office with not one bad word about that doctor and they get worse instead of better. So she pushes her way through she pushes her way through. She finally gets a hold of the garment of Jesus. Jesus doesn't even know she's there. The Father didn't tell her. And all of a sudden, something happened. Virtue, anointing came out of Jesus. Woo! Came out of them. You can feel it sometimes when I pray my hands on people. Sometimes I lay my hands on somebody's head and, and nothing is happening. And other times, I can lay my hands on people and I can literally spiritually feel the power of God being sucked right out of me from heaven. Just I'm just like a piece of wire. <sighs> faith is so, you can see faith. He turned around and said, who touched me? Who touched me? And the disciples said, whoa, we didn't, because he, he was excited. He said, well, we don't know what got you excited. He got excited because there was faith. Somebody touched him with the touch of faith. And finally the woman trembling came and said, I've touched you. He said, oh, lady, your faith has made you whole. Give the Lord a hand clap and a shout. People aren't getting healed in America because they're like all that multitude waiting for the water to stir, for the angel to come. Oh, the medicine's going to help me. Oh, you sure? Are you sure that medicine isn't just making you worse? Are you sure? Are you, oh, that operation is going to help me. Are you sure it's not just going to make you worse? No, I'm, I'm, listen, God will work with you where you're at. I understand this. But don't you think that maybe you should try to get a hold of God? Don't, don't you think you ought to give God a chance first before you give the medical world a chance to mess you up? You know how many people I pray? You know what? I think most times when I pray for people, I think 75% of the time I pray for people, it's for, the, the, for God to help them as a result of what the doctor did to them. <laughs> really? Most times. Oh, Pastor Mike, will you pray for me? I went and had an operation, and my back is more messed up now than it ever was. Okay. Will God heal you? Yeah, he'll heal you. But don't you think it's better? To begin to look to God? My, I'm not being critical. People be watching this from Facebook. I, it boggles my mind. I go to Facebook and I purposely don't read a lot of the posts. 
Because most of the posts are just going on and on and on and on and on about their problems. Very little is talking about Jesus. And so I'll put something in and say, well, why don't we maybe begin to exalt Jesus above our problems and they begin to attack me. <laughs> well, who do you think you are? So I'm not ta- listen, listen, put down your rocks. I'm just saying, you know, he's the healer. He is the physician. He is the psychiatrist. We always used to do this. Now listen, we had a Christian school for years. They'd bring these kids in all messed up from the secular world. This was my requirement. I said, okay, if I'm gonna, we're going to take your kid. There's, are they on medication? On Ritalin or whatever they got? Yes. I said, you got to take them off. What? Take them off all the medication. What? You're going to deal with them? Yeah. Take them off the medication. Okay. Every single one of them were normal kids when they got off the medication. So here's a true story. One day I got a phone call. This will be the last story. I got a phone call from a family who watched me on TV out of Carlisle. They had a little girl by the name of Sarah. Sarah was an absolute utter mess. First of all, they had her on all kinds of medications. Second of all, she had what they call, and I can't give you the, the, the it's, in, it's in my books, it tick syndrome, her head. I, I don't even want to imitate her. Her head was like this, all the, like a woodpecker, like this. Like this, all the time, all the time. They called me up and they said, Pastor Mike, uh, our daughter has got major problems. We can't control her. The school said they've had enough. Uh, She runs out in the parking lot. She crawls under the car. She's about 10 years old. They want us to put her in Hershey, the medical center. She went into the principal's office and wiped it out. I said, what do you mean she wiped it out? She took her hands and she destroyed his office. I mean, this little girl just went berserk. Kind of a tall, skinny little 10-year-old, Sarah. Pastor Mike, can you help? Can you help us? And I, I said, well, hold on. And I got quiet and I said, Lord, can I help her? He said, yeah, we can help her. I said, yeah, I can help her. I said, but you're going to have to listen to exactly what I say. They said, okay, okay, we're desperate. We don't want to put her in a mental institution in Hersey. I said, she's only 10 years old. I said, that's fine. We've got three months of school left. Bring her. So they brought her. She comes and heads like this. And I said, okay. I said, um. I said, here's the deal. I said, number one, take her off all medication. What? What? We can't control her. She comes off all medication or I can't help you. I said, number two, the minute you drop her off, you leave. You do not come back until it's time to pick her up. Now, I can't get into all the, but the Lord showed me what was going on. I had a a spirit of discernment going on. I said, and we'll start working with her. So now I had a meeting with my teachers. I let them know. Now we got a little girl named Sarah. I don't want you yelling at her. I don't want you screaming at her. I don't want you being ugly to her. I said when she comes, she's going to be a distraction. I said, and when she comes every morning, you, one of you uh, women teachers, I had, I had uh, uh, 21 people on our staff at one time. I said, one of you teachers, you're going to be with. And every time, the minute she gets off, out of the car, we're taking her into a room, and I'm going to pray with little Sarah. Okay, pastor. So here comes Sarah, and we sit down. I said, oh, Sarah, give me your hands. And I prayed very gently, quietly. Now, Lord, I just speak peace over her mind, and you're a liar, devil. Now, she wasn't demon-possessed. She was demon-oppressed. See, a lot of people don't know this stuff. They don't, I know when we, it's, it, see, it comes and it goes. And I pray over her, very gentle, not a real long. And I said, now, if you have any problems with Sarah, you get a hold of me right away. And, and, and I think I was probably one of the first guys around that had a cell phone in those days, a big bulky uh, military. I got it from the government. I bought it. At, you know, so they, Pastor Mike, Sarah's acting up. I said, okay, I'll be right there. And I'd drop it. If I couldn't be there, I'd get one of the other ladies who knew how to pray. And I'd go and pray with Sarah. And this went on day after day. And Sarah began to get better. And she began to get better. And parents were shocked. Her grades began to go up. I'm not lying. By the end of that school year, the tick syndrome was gone. She was an A-plus student. And she was a completely different little girl. I never saw her again. They didn't need us anymore. I got a phone call beginning the next school year. 
the principal called me from the school. She called me up and said, uh, Reverend Yeager, we can't believe the change in Sarah. What did you do to Sarah? We need to know, what did you do to Sarah? I said, we did something you can't. She said, well, what's that? I said, we would pray over her every day very gently in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, oh, okay, well, thank you. And she hung up the phone. We've got the answer, people. Didn't need a medication. All of those kids that came in here through years, every one of them came off the medication. And they did wonderful. Wonderful.